Hello, thank you very much for joining us online. This is the first, our first experiment with an online version of the public conversation series at the UN University headquarters in Tokyo. The UN University uh, operates in 13 or 14 locations globally uh, through groups of uh, researchers on very specific subjects and uh, often associated graduate uh, study programs, uh, often mostly in partnership with a leading local university in those localities. Um, but we're coming to you from Tokyo and we have with us uh, Philip Green, Sir Philip Green, uh, who is the chairman of Springer Nature. Now I think nearly everybody coming online is familiar with the uh, magazine uh, Nature, but the magazine is just one expression of a huge amount of uh, uh, content and data that Nature has been building up over the years. And before we get into the uh, substance of nature itself uh, and its implications for COVID-19 uh, and uh, other uh, topics. I did want to ask Philip, uh, who is a graduate of uh, British universities uh, with a PhD from, uh, um, uh, I can't even describe the department, it's so abstruse, but at the University of Leicester. Um, I did want to ask Philip about the huge success of the Nature Group. Its identity has been mutating over the years, but what many of us thought of as a magazine at one point actually is so much more than a magazine today. And you've been intimately involved with this development over time. So I wanted to ask you how that came about. Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I really appreciate the invitation. Um, so when I started off as the editor in chief of Nature, uh, which is a long time ago, I have to say in 1995, uh, Nature consisted primarily of uh, a journal plus some magazine components in the form of editorials and comment articles and journalism. Um, and then at the same time, there were two or three actually other Nature journals that existed. Uh, Nature Structural Biology, as it was then called, uh, Nature Medicine had just got off the ground and we were beginning to look at nature biotechnology. So um, a tiny little group at that time. And then over the years, as we began to launch new journals, those journals succeeded. And it, as we still do every time we launch a new nature journal, whether it's a review journal or a research journal, we really do look at whether or not the community wants it. And um, because otherwise it's, it's gonna be a failure, obviously. And I mean that not only because it's the nature brand and that's prestigious, but because there really is a need for it in terms of the dynamics of the research community and the growth of the research community. So um, uh, I know somebody's gonna ask me how many nature journals are there and I actually don't know, <laughs> right? The number has grown sign. so tremendously. But I will say, I will just highlight two things. Um, one, that the magazine component of these journals, and especially Nature, has really strengthened over the years, and it's now a powerhouse of, I'm going to say it, award-winning journalism and comment. Um, and then at the same time, the journals um, have multiplied, but they've also kept the tradition of disciplinary-oriented journals, like Nature Astronomy, for example, uh, but also they've moved into societal challenge areas, which are much more thematic and multidisciplinary. The first of which was Nature Climate Change, and because we saw that working and because the attention to the societal challenges was growing, we then started to launch others like nature sustainability and nature human behavior, nature energy, and so on. Mm. And all of these issues that over time have been acquiring more and more public profile. So you were uh, able both to anticipate and occasionally capture a trend in public interest, shaping it as you went along. 
Uh, yes, I think that is true to an extent. I think the, I mean, obviously, the, the key drivers of this are what the researchers are, are interested in and how that is evolving. And uh, some of these, uh, one of the pleasures of the job I have at the moment as editor-in-chief of Springer Nature is to bring together the disciplines. And people are always talking about multidisciplinarity and how important it is, but it's still a big challenge, actually. And if you look at our journals that are multidisciplinary, I think we've helped to foster the multidisciplinary approach within the journals. And we do that both in terms of the papers we publish, some of which are actually multidisciplinary, not all of them. Some of them are just from different disciplines, but some of them are genuinely multidisciplinary. And then also the advocacy we can do in our magazine sections towards multidisciplinary and in encouraging funding agencies and universities as to how they can help foster multidisciplinarity. So in that sort of rather generic sense, we've played a role. And then I'm, I hope that by championing certain areas of research, we've helped to grow it and encourage it out there in the world. Well, there's a huge focus on science at the moment uh, amongst the wider public. We all follow the news day to day on COVID-19 and everything we don't know yet about COVID-19. And as uh, new hypotheses are formulated, uh, sometimes tested fairly quickly, sometimes invalidated almost immediately, it's been an illustration to the wider public of how the inner workings of science and scientific research proceed. Uh, and in effect, by trial and error and uh, constant testing, so to speak, another word that's become very routine during the COVID-19 crisis. So there have been a number of dynamics at work here, and I've been able to see how my colleagues are dealing with those in different ways. So one of the dynamics is the preprint servers that sort have of in physics have been there for ages, but uh, in recent years have grown in chemistry and in biology and in medicine. And of course, the, 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 the great thing about those preprint servers is that they get ideas out very fast. So the research community can actually respond. The physics communities that originated these preprint approaches quite small and do a lot of peer review you know informally and so it was quite a safe thing to do there was always a bit of concern when you get into medicine especially if you're going to put out papers that have not been yet through the journal process that you're going to take risks with people's public understanding getting misled and, and when i say people i mean not just the public i mean doctors you know because they too are dependent on peer review for the accuracy so there's been that, and so the onus on us has been to take some of these papers and publish them as rapidly as we can while maintaining the standards. And that's a really major challenge when you're being bombarded with these papers. So that's been one aspect that we've responded to. And I think the other thing I would highlight is some of the coverage we've done, and I hope maybe some of the correcting we've done about misinformation and about in the social networks especially, there is completely misleading information that's getting out there. Some of it well-intentioned, you know, people just hearing things yeah. and spreading it and say, have you heard this? And, and some of it absolutely deliberately, de deliberate, whether between nations, you know, where you have um, bots actually set up by government agencies uh, to, to be hostile, or people like anti-vaccine groups who for their own reasons are trying to undermine confidence in proven therapies. Absolutely, with more success than many of us would have liked and Absolutely. consequences for public health. So that's been also another interesting research area as people look at um, the behavioral aspects of this. You know, why is it that people, uh, you know, respond to certain types of stories, even if they're false and want to spread them? even if they're not deliberately trying to undermine the system or even kill people, which is, you know, what can happen as a result of some of this information. Of course, it doesn't help, I'm going to say this, when leading politicians also take a stance on things that are extremely dubious. And that dynamic is also very important when you look at how the politics of the population divides and how that overlaps with the divides in about misinformation and uh, trying to promote anti-vaccine or anti-climate change narratives. 
Um, so that in itself is a very interesting area of research, and some of our journals publish that. And clearly, there are so, uh, while some societies are much more vulnerable to uh, science deny, uh, denial, so to speak, um, in nearly every society, there seems to be a subset of people who are inclined in that direction, not necessarily undereducated people. Yes, um, I think that's true. I think I think every I don't I don't think there's any reason to think that this isn't part of human nature. Indeed. So I so I think I think every country will will have this, and I think there are different components to it. Mm -hmm. There are some people who are you know resentful of elites and associate some of the uh, good advice that scientists are giving them with that sort of elitist sort of thing. There are people who are resentful of uh, politics that they associate with regulation um, and why that goes against their liberal values. So that's another factor that can be there. And there can be just fear. I mean, actual fear of um, what you've heard from friends when they vaccinated their child and that child then developed some other condition. And that, that in itself can help amplify messages that they can then find on the social media. And I think that's, as I said, all part of human nature. Indeed. Now, I wanted to come to uh, something that uh, nature has had a real impact on over time, which is the nexus of climate change, food security. We tend to take food for granted. And in Japan, which is a hugely well-supplied country, has supply chains all over the world, during the recent COVID uh, lockdown, there were actually shortages of fresh produce in a country that produces huge amounts of fresh produce. So uh, these connections between apparently unconnected issues and phenomena during something like the COVID-19 uh, peak lockdown or emergency periods seem to come together in ways that are tremendously worrying for publics. Yeah. So one could look at this at different levels uh, uh, for urgent thinking. So if you just look at cities, I think one of the encouraging things that was happening during the debates about climate change in, in many countries is how city mayors and city planning departments were taking on board the messages about climate change and really listening to researchers and involving them. Um, so I think the same is with food systems. People are now beginning to think at the city's level or town level about how their cities depend on these different networks and how they need to change those dependencies. So that, for example, the supply networks are more local and hence more available, not so dependent on mega supply chains of very big companies. Um, and, and that's one thing. And they're rethinking the food waste systems, etc. So these are all things that individual cities are beginning to do. And of course, these things have, need to happen at the national level too. Mm. And then you get into the much bigger issues um, where, which relates absolutely to COVID, which is, um, you know, the, the way COVID hit us was from, we think, a bat um, originally in a wet market and, and so on. But the relationship between forest clearance and infectious diseases is something that I certainly hadn't appreciated until recently, you know, thinking about these things. But if you clear a forest, you change all sorts of things about the soil and the wildlife that are in those forests. You begin to concentrate species together in a way that weren't there before. So if they have diseases inside their particular uh, populations, those diseases become intensified. And then if in the clearing, you're getting human contact where you didn't have it before, that increases the spread. And then you get more light, which can affect the way mosquitoes breed. You get more water because the water table changes. They're extraordinarily complex. So the way in which humanity and ecosystems and disease <laughs> interact is something that we just need to be more mindful of. And once you begin to realize that, I'm sure you don't need in-depth research to make some straightforward joinings up of interests between government ministries, for example, mm. to, to tackle those things. But you do need research for the longer term, you know, to, to help prevent the next pandemic or to, 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 or to mitigate it or whatever, because it's obviously but, long term. 
I was going to say in relation to what you've been describing that in practice it may be much harder to bring these elements together in improving policy because many of the best researchers have limited interest in public policy. Uh, so there it takes another variety of intellectual entrepreneur to come in. Yeah. So um, I, I'm going to be slightly provocative here and say that if UN rectors paid more attention to this, that would be good too, because the incentives of academics to get involved in policy mm. is, are also a problem, or the lack of incentives, I should say, because it doesn't look good on your CV if you haven't produced 10 papers, that, you, know, you know, that mm -hmm. dilemma that you have as to how you use your time. Um, but it is also true to say that the link between policy, and this is something I'm very interested in as an editor of the literature, that, that you can publish any number of papers and for policymakers to get it needs a bridge. And sometimes you have institutions that are bridges and sometimes only academics can be the bridge. And the only way they can really do that is to be in the room. So, you know, every, every government has to think about how it uses the scientific expertise that it has to gain access to the knowledge. Mm. Um, but that being said, we, we publishers are looking at how to summarize knowledge. We have things called policy briefs in uh, the nature journals that we're trying to grow, which help authors uh, deliver a parallel message to policymakers. Mm. And there are other, other things we are doing, but also academics themselves are doing. Um, in getting summaries of messages to different types of decision makers, whether they're in industry or in government. So there is a movement there, no question. And if we can get the incentives better for, within the institutions, and if we can get the policymakers and the, the bridge to policymakers better, there is, there is Interesting hope. to see politicians during the COVID crisis often relying on the presence of uh, senior scientists. Yeah. Their own credibility is yeah. really up to it on the yeah. So, so I've known some. I've known some great. Only a few. I mean, I don't. I don't fraternise with government ministers habitually, <laughs> but I've managed to meet one or two over the years. And some of them, um, the least political of them, people actually, people who came into the thing to be a science minister rather than to be a politician. They have been very good in my past experience in the middle of crises at making sure that the science advice was there and, and could be seen by people. Mm. In contrast, and I'm afraid this is currently true within the British government, yes, they have absolutely depended on the science advisors. They published the science advice belatedly, but it is noticeable both in Britain and America, actually, that the leadership has the scientists there right alongside them as long as that is convenient for them. Indeed and not too embarrassing. And so it, both in Britain and in uh, America, I've seen some of the expertise sidelined. Uh, finally, I wanted to ask you about health research uh, uh, itself. It, it seems like a nearly infinite field. Uh, we, we know quite a lot already, but there's so much more I think we probably don't know yet. And how, as an editor and manager of a very large business, uh, do you approach this uh, huge field of knowledge, but also the deficits in our knowledge? Um, as far as the deficits are concerned, we can, we can try to advocate for more research in areas where the deficits are most acute. Um, there are other types of, of problems within health uh, such as comorbidity, right? So everything is so siloed in health research and in health institutions and in primary care. Uh, in, obviously, in primary care, you will get to a generalist. But once you get, then get referred on in the British system, certainly, uh, into the National Health Service, which is a wonderful institution, um, you're, you're very quickly siloed. So if you have three different conditions which might have been related to each other, you've got to, you have to manage this you know, separate network of expertise. So, I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a growing issue, actually. And, the, and, and what interests me, especially in that, is the relationship between physical health and mental health or mental ill health and how those exacerbate each other. And so, um, again, funding agencies and others are trying to get to grips with that. 
So I do think um, those bigger questions, or if you like, more general questions, are just as important. Um, what's been great to see, I have to say, on the health front is if you look at vaccines and COVID, you know, there have been some really good looking, I mean, it's early, early days, right? But the public private partnerships that have been set up by the National Institutes of Health, for example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others, bringing together companies in collaborative frameworks, sharing data, sharing trial information, and trying to bring common standards to each of their strands of work. Um, that's very hopeful. I mean, it's an innovation in itself, and how that's going to turn out is going to be very interesting. I don't want to be, I don't want to be too rosy-colored spectacles about industry, because we know that they have bad habits as well in terms of, you know, the prices that they may be charging, et cetera. So, um, but right. anyway, I, well, I, I'm, I could, I'm optimistic. I could bang on forever asking you questions, but uh, Basilio has joined us now and he's been looking at the questions which have been flowing in since we started chatting. So Basilio, right. over to you. Thanks, David. We have an interesting question from Fatime Hassani, a student at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. And the question is, uh, scientists need statistics in order to discover the solution to combat COVID-19. However, governments in many countries don't want to show the real statistics such as number of cases, deaths, and so on. What is a solution to the dilemma where the interests of researchers and governments are different? That's a really great, challenging question. Um, it was very interesting uh, in a visit I did to the World Health Organization where they really do try to collect all the data that's coming out about an emerging disease. Um, the challenges they were facing because of the intrinsic resistance to sharing. That happens within scientific collaborations too. And so the only thing we can do as a journal, so this is a very limited part of the, the landscape you've pointed to, is insist that at least the data that are behind the paper that we're publishing are shared. And so we're getting tougher and tougher. And it's not just us on the Nature Journals. This is an industry-wide prerequisite. We're getting tougher and tougher on, show, on insisting that people show where the data can be got, or if we host them, that's fine too, or in community hubs. that We, we will insist on that before we publish the paper. Great. Great. I have another question from Elena Evangelidis, a uh, recent graduate of Leiden University. Um, what can scientific publishers do to ensure that the COVID-19 crisis is used as a gateway into a greener economy and to prevent the exploitation of the crisis to push through environmentally damaging policies? Yeah, so the number of plans that are now beginning to emerge for coming out of COVID um, that are green, quote, um, it is growing, and I think I saw a headline just today about uh, some plan that one of our political parties has produced in Britain. Um, it is really, really worrying about how, I'm just amplifying the question, I'm afraid. It is really worrying about how we could go completely wrong here and totally stymie the, any progress we might be making towards the Paris agreements on emissions. So, uh, but there are ways of focusing on solar energy, on renewables, etc., to make and and the, in ways that actually help employment, in ways that help build new industries. But it's true that as a politician, you've got to be really long-sighted to take that to take that view when you can see jobs just vanishing in front of you. But it is crucial for the for the longer-term interests of all of us that those greener approaches are taken. And all we can do is just highlight that in our pages publish research that investigates that, publish research that points to those greener solutions. And across our disciplines, our journals and our books, we've already got literatures about that and we will be certainly publishing more. Um, well, on that, I, I wanted to add that uh, uh, my leader, Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the UN, always speaks about COVID and climate change together. Mm -hmm as a desperately acute short-term challenge. It won't extinguish the human race, but it could take many, many lives. Climate yeah. change could actually extinguish not just the human race, but yeah. other forms of life. Yeah. I think if, um, if one frames that in terms of vulnerability, um, that's one way to, do, to think about the two together. Because mm. the COVID is just a brilliant example. 
I mean, some, uh, it was Margaret Chan, I think, ex-head of the WHO, who called it the most cunning virus she'd ever seen during her life. And, and it, it just is, but it's real and it's there. And it's following the laws of chemistry, physics and biology, as it were. And that's what climate change does too. It, it doesn't, doesn't mind about us. And mm -hmm. the planet actually, in a sense, doesn't mind about us. So um, to, to think of those vulnerabilities, I think, is a key way of joining up the lessons from COVID into the climate. Terrific. Back to you, Basilio. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Professor Gary Lilenthal from Nalzar University of Law in Hyderabad. Can you describe how you assess whether or not the community wants a new journal? Yeah, we, we do market research. Uh, we look at the growth of the literatures. We look at the growth of funding. We do surveys. We actually talk to researchers. Our communities are, you know, our editors on the nature journals are are out there when they're allowed to be at the moment. It's, it's lots of virtual conversations, but you know, we, we are well connected into the communities. And so, um, so I'll, I'll just give you one example, Nature Astronomy. For many years, we decided not to launch Nature Astronomy. As, a, as a, someone who used to do astronomy myself, I was always keen to do so. But on the other hand, the world looked very well supplied by astronomy journals from uh, the societies. And then it, there just became a moment where in response to the community, there seemed to be a good justification to have it. And actually, if you ask me why exactly, what the elements of that were, I'm not sure I could say. They may not have been wholly good elements in the sense that some of the motivation might be, we need the name nature to brand astronomy, to help astronomy get its funding. You know, there is that as a part of some of these things. But, for, but for, nevertheless, the amount of astronomy funding and the, num the, the amount of really incredible astronomy being done with new technologies was growing. The impact of astronomy was growing. So the, the conditions changed, but we were responding to the world. It wasn't us just deciding that it should be done. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and that will be from uh, Dr. Pascal Alote, director of the UNU International Institute for Global Health. Uh, she would like to know, can you comment on whether there is a strategy for retraction? Is it, as, is it as simple as publishing errata or do you invest in promoting the messaging? The autism yeah. case with the Lancet being an example. Yeah, so um, we absolutely have a strategy for retractions. We've revisited it several times over the years across the entire group of uh, Spring and Nature. And uh, the aim is to publish a retraction as soon as you possibly can. Once you're sure, the complication becomes twofold. One, retractions can be really difficult to validate as a retraction rather than just a correction, to really be sure that the whole paper needs to go. It can be very, it, it shouldn't be damaging for the careers of the researchers involved, but sometimes it is. Of course, if it's, if, if it's being driven by a, a, a piece of fraud or something, that's, that's a different matter. Then we just have to work as fast as possible to correct that. But when there are genuine errors involved and you, you need to dig into those and be clear what actually was the problem before you decide, it could take a long time. And then I'm going to say one other thing that doesn't help. People can get very legalistic about it. And universities know this as well. When you get into inquiries about misconduct, lawyers can get involved. And we do get letters from lawyers saying, if you publish this retraction, we will sue. And uh, we usually don't respond to those. We don't we don't act on those because in the end, we're completely justified in retracting. But I just want to say that retractions are something we completely support in principle. And it's only when things get complicated that they get delayed. Great, Philip. I think we could go on and on. I look forward to going on and on when you come to Tokyo. Uh, you. It's ahead whenever that becomes possible. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us online this evening. It's not as much fun as a trip to Japan or for me, a trip to Britain. Uh, it takes up a lot of your time and we're deeply grateful. Thank you very much indeed. I really enjoyed it actually. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Philip.